discussion about CFTs and Bootstrap. Hi, good morning, everyone. So, so far what we have done is discuss um, operators in conformal field theories. We looked yesterday at constraints that one gets when they consider uh, correlation functions uh, of operators and the constraints, the extra constraints that uh, dilatations and special conformal transformations impose on correlation functions compared to the case where you have just Poincaré uh, symmetry. So today, uh, we will talk about a sort of a complementary point of view, which involves um, states and you know, quantum mechanical-like statements in conformal field theories. And we will do this because it will help us discuss a few things about, uh, about, um, uh, about certain, uh, certain uh, mathematical procedures we will use to work with correlation functions, like for example, the operator product expansion. And we will also discuss unitarity bounds, uh, which arise most easily when viewed in radial quantization. So let's, let's get going. So, you know, when you quantize a theory, what you typically do is you take your d-dimensional space-time and you foliate it, right? You say, okay, I have my d-dimensional space-time and I'm going to define some surfaces, you know, lots of surfaces. And these are all d-minus-one dimensional surfaces and there is some sort of parameter, maybe you call it time, that evolves you along these surfaces. And traditionally, when we have Poincaré invariant CFTs, we choose the generator of these time translations to be the Hamiltonian, or P0, right? The zeroth component of the momentum. So uh, our uh, states are defined on each of these uh, hypersurfaces on each of these uh, leaves of the foliation. Uh, we assign a Hilbert space, states live in that Hilbert space, and we then define how we can take inner products of states that live in the same Hilbert space, and then we also define how we evolve states from one Hilbert space to the other, say from this one to this one, under, un under unitary evolution with some operator uh, U, which is something like e to the i h t, right? Okay, so this is, this is what we do in regular uh, quantum field theory. In practice, what we want to use as much as possible is of course symmetry. So we want, we want to use foliations that preserve symmetries. And in conformal field theories, we have more symmetries than just Poincaré, and it is convenient to consider a different type of foliation of space-time. And um, the different type of foliation that we will consider in CFTs is is a certain foliation um, by spheres D minus one dimensional spheres, but these are not unit spheres. They have of, uh, of different radii, okay? So the picture you might draw here is that you have some point and you, know, you have spheres around that point of different radii, uh, and this is a convenient foliation of space-time for the case of conformal field theories. Now, um, you, may, you, may, you may wonder what is the generator that moves you from states, from, 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 hyper, from, um, from leaf to leaf in this foliation. Here we said it was the Hamiltonian. Here, the role of the Hamiltonian is played by the dilatation operator. So the logic is as follows. States, again, live on these spheres, and the way you go from state 
from states in one leaf to a state in the other is by evolution, not with the Hamiltonian, but with the dilatation operator. Okay? So, so um, in radial quantization, what we what plays the role of the Hamiltonian is the dilatation operator. Okay? Good. And because of this, when you choose the Hamiltonian, you define states in the Hilbert space as eigenstates of that Hamiltonian, right? In the same Hilbert space. Here, the states will be eigenstates of this dilatation operator. So we have to figure out what eigenstates of the dilatation operator are. And you remember, that we wrote, you can take, you know, some operator. Yesterday we, will, we were calling it OI of X, and we wrote that this is minus I X dot D plus delta uh, OI of X. We didn't define states at all, we just talked about operators. Now we have to define states, but from this uh, equation over here, it seems like if we took X equal to zero, things look like we could define states with a specific eigenvalue minus i delta that uh, the dilatation operator has as eigenstates, right? So this is, this is what we go, we're going to do. We will say that there will be some states uh, that the dilatation operator acts on. We will denote them by uh, ket with uh, delta inside. And this will be the states generated by an action of the operator O delta on uh, the vacuum stage, which uh, uh, is the state with you know, zero delta, if you want. And this we can now, we can now, um, we can now compute in the, in the standard way. We can use the operator now. And then there is another term here. So the commutator uh, has this part, but it also has minus uh, the other order. But we assume that there is a state that's annihilated by D, the vacuum state. And so we then use the commutation relation to write this as minus I, um, minus I delta times O delta on O, which we then call again. So this is good, okay? We found an eigenstate, delta. It's the state generated by the action of the operator O delta on the state that is the vacuum that's annihilated by the operator D. Okay, good. So what is the picture then? How does an operator create a state? An operator creates a state by being inserted inside, so here is, here is the picture, um, states are, are generated on the sphere by inserting operators inside the sphere. There are various special operators for one of them is uh, one thing you can do is not insert anything, right? And if you don't insert anything, uh, this corresponds to the vacuum state that I discussed. You insert nothing inside the sphere, and you're going to get your vacuum state. Then you might uh, you might get the state uh, delta, as we discussed right there, by inserting. You get the state delta when you insert O delta at zero. Okay. 
we took x equals zero here. This is how we, how we construct the state delta. We insert the operator O delta at x equals zero. Now what happens when you insert O delta at point x, not at x equals zero? In that case, you do not get an eigenstate of the dilatation operator. So suppose you insert O delta at x other than zero. Then what happens is, let's evaluate this, O delta at x, let's act, let's act with this on the vacuum. Now we, um, we know what it means to have an operator at x, and we know how to get the operator at zero from an operator at x, right? We just do the e to the i, uh, let me get my signs here, i p dot x, O delta at zero, e to the minus i, p dot x, at zero, so this is how we move an operator around. Uh, and now, from this exponential, we have to understand it as a series expansion, right? And from the series expansion, P on the vacuum, any power of P on the vacuum will give the vacuum back. Sorry, will give zero. So the only thing that will survive from the exponential is the one in the beginning, which will just give us the vacuum. So I can write this again as the vacuum. Right? And then O delta at zero acting on the vacuum is the state delta, right? So this becomes e to the i px on the state delta. And again, we have to understand this as a series expansion. Sum over n, one over n factorial, i px to the n on the state delta. So acting with p on the state delta and then with p squared and so on and so forth, it's non-trivial, and it will give us an infinite linear combination of states in the Hilbert space that correspond to the insertion of the operator O delta at the point x that is not zero. Okay? Good. So to one operator at a generic point x, we associate an infinite number of states that are generated by acting on the state delta at zero with, success, with more and more powers of the momentum. Now, you can, you can ask, say take one power of the momentum uh, and act on delta, on, on, a state, on, on, the, on a state delta, is that an eigenstate then again of the dilatation operator or not? So for that, you want to compute D, say, on P mu on delta. And this can be done by using the algebra. So you take the commutator, and then you add the term that you didn't have. So you have P mu D on delta. And now here you use the algebra, so if you remember, this was minus i p mu on delta, just from the algebra we wrote down yesterday. And then this is p mu, and here we had, well, let's, let's write it out front, minus i delta p mu on delta, since this is an eigenstate of the dilatation operator. And so what we get is we get um, minus i delta plus one p mu on delta. So indeed, the state p mu on delta is an eigenstate of the dilatation operator, but with eigenvalue, you know, delta plus one, if this eigenvalue is delta. So what we see is that acting with the momentum raises the scaling, what we call the scaling dimension of the operator, or of the state delta, rather. So this states that op inserting an operator at a generic point x inserts all these states. They are all uh, states with dimension delta, delta plus one, delta plus two, and so on, right? So the way um, Um, 
so we have the state delta, then we act with P, we get the state delta plus one, then obviously if we act again with P, we'll get the state delta plus two, and this never stops. So we'll get an infinite number of states. Now, if you remember, there was another operator in the theory, K mu, the generator of special conformal transformations, that happened to have a different sign here. So in the algebra, D with P mu was giving minus I P mu, but D with K mu was giving plus I K mu. And since this sign is different, this sign here is gonna be different. So this K mu operator is also gonna be doing, uh, gonna be changing the eigenvalue of the, you will still get eigenstates, but the eigenvalue will now be going down when you act with K mu, okay? So there is a corresponding procedure where you can start with, um, with a state delta and get to it from higher states Uh, with an action of the generator of special conformal transformations, okay? So this is how you move around in this, in this uh, multiplet of states. So you, you, you can move between the different states acting with P going up or acting with K going down. Now physically, this procedure, we, on physical grounds, we wrote these deltas, remember, in, in um, powers in correlation functions. In the two-point function, we had, you know, one over x, one, two to some power delta, right? So we don't want this delta to become negative on physical grounds because then that would mean that correlations grow with distance, right? Which is counterintuitive. So what we expect is that at some point, k acting on a sufficiently small delta would turn the eigenvalue negative and we don't want that to happen, so then k on that delta must give zero. So you may then view this k you know, as a lowering operator, and this p as a raising operator, and the lowering operator annihilates the ground state in, or the, the, the lowest energy, uh, in this case, delta state. Okay, so there is we have now, based on these, on these statements here, we, we now know, uh, so we know that we can get states from operators. Okay, this is good. Conversely, you can argue that you can also get uh, this also works the other way around. That if you have states, then you can define associated operators and you can define their correlation functions in the usual way. Uh, so you have both states from operators and operators from states in conformal field theories. And this is what sometimes is referred to as the state operator correspondence. You can talk about either and there is sort of a one-to-one -one, uh, mapping uh, of statements that you can make in one picture and the other, okay? Okay, so we defined states. Are there any questions about this so far? Yes. To, to what? Sorry, I didn't hear. Which CFT it is? No, yeah, these are completely general statements. Yeah. It, the states that you will define that way will not be these states over here. Is that the question? Right. Yeah. Yes. It depends on the foliation you choose, right? Well, if I have a Hamiltonian like in that case, in the ECIFC, what Hamiltonian is that? It's always the 
Yeah. Yeah, you, you can you can define you, you can take a you can quantize a CFT, uh, talk about Hilbert spaces and so on, doing exactly what you do in QFT. You can you can definitely do that. Here, the reason why we do this is not clear yet. It will become more clear. But talking about states defined in this radial quantization way of doing things will allow us to do various nice things that you will see in a little bit that would be very hard to do if you chose to quantize. I mean, there's nothing fundamental about doing it this way. I mean, it's just a trick in some sense that allows us to then derive some things that would be very hard to derive in the picture that you're describing, which is perfectly valid, however. Yes? Yeah, so here we can go both ways. We can get states from operators and operators from states. Of course, whenever you have an operator, you can act on the vacuum and get a state in any... Yes, 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 exactly. Here, I went through this specifically because I wanted to describe exactly how the states uh, in this unfamiliar, you know, uh, quantization look like in, in conformal field theories. Yes? Um, um, in that case, um, I, I don't know if it would generate an eigenstate of the dilatation. It would not generate an eigenstate of the dilatation operator. So like it, would some it would generate some state, yes, but it would not be one of these, one of these states over here. Yes. So, given a state, how do you describe the operator by a point? Oh, you just define, you know, suppose you have a... Suppose you have some correlation, maybe let me write it here. So to go from, um, from state to operator in a CFT, it is enough to uh, write down all the correlation functions that operators in the theory will satisfy in that state, right? And then I have defined what I mean. For example, you might take, I don't know, the vacuum and then some phi at x1, you can have many of them at xn, and then you can choose the state delta, let's say. Okay? To define the associated operator, you identify this um, with the inserting in the correlation function the operator O delta at zero. Now you define the operator at zero, and once you define the operator at zero using the correlation functions, you can define it at any point using the standard, uh, using the standard uh, translation for the operator. Define the operator for the Sorry? How do you define the operator? Like comparing the two Yes, 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 we're comparing the correlation functions. And you may have to compare many of them, but in principle you can do it. Yep. Okay. Um, well, I think in CFTs, correlation functions of local operators generally behave uh, in, you know, the symmetry allows you, as we will see in a little bit, and using the operator product expansion that we'll describe in a little bit, allows you to get well-defined decompositions of these correlation functions and define the operators that way. In quantum field theory, you could write this equation down but I'm not sure how easy it would be to then define an appropriate operator in that same sense. Uh, but, but maybe you can, yes, please.
it's by construction, right? This side exists, so I am constructing on the other side a correlation function with an appropriate O delta that is equal to that side. It's, it's, a, construct, it's a constructive argument. It's not necessary, I think, for a, for a, for a regular, regular QFT. For CFTs, uh, for CFTs, I think this construction uh, does go through. Maybe, I don't know if, do you have any? Sorry, which one? Yes, yes, yes. In general, well, if you take this state delta to be one of the eigenstates I was discussing, then it's some, you know, primary at zero. But in general, any the, 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 the point is, is that for any, yeah, maybe that's a better way to say it. Thanks for that. The point is, is that for any state in the Hilbert space here, I will be able to write it as a superposition of primaries and descendants, okay? So whatever state I put here, I will be able to use this uh, construction that I made to map back this into an insertion of an operator into the vacuum correlation function, which is not necessarily true in a general quantum field theory, I think. Yes? Well, if you, if you perform, so these are like flat space correlation functions. If you perform any conformal transformation to go to any conformally equivalent space, then all this goes through. But if you don't, so the torus would not, well, is, the torus would not be uh, a conformal transformation of the plane. For example, the cylinder will be, and we will talk about this later, but the torus will not. And in that case, uh, I'm not sure. I don't think it, uh, it's automatic but I'm not entirely sure. There is an issue with, with the torus that you kind of print uh, all, all of QF to zero. So the, this is interesting. Because the paper is entirely trying to summarize what Fraser says are comments on, on the torus, but they get So locally, they still have it. But globally... Yeah. Yes. Oh, it is. I mean, we'll see, we'll see it. I mean, the cylinder and the plane are, uh, they're related by a conformal transformation, right? In any D, I thought, but, yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so let's now use this construction of states to define uh, what we mean by unitarity. Now that we have a Hilbert space, now that we have a Hilbert space, uh, we are free to start taking norms in the Hilbert space and demanding that things are positive, right? But before we are able to take norms, what we should define is how we conjugate, how we take the complex conjugate. And um, if you are in Minkowski and signature in conformal field theory, uh, we know how to take the uh, conjugate. Um, 
for any, for, any, for any operator, for example, at the point x, you will write this as e to the i p dot x, operator at zero, e to the minus i p dot x, and you will have, uh, you know, a certain conjugation. A conjugation will then bring this to this side, and because of the i, it will become a plus. So the conjugated operator will look exactly the same like as this with a no dagger here, right? Now, um, in order to discuss unitarity in radial quantization, uh, it is, it is, it, this, is not, this is not something we can do because we quantized using the dilatation operator to define our states, but still we move, we move operators around using the momentum. So, it's sort of incompatible, right? We have to find a way to go back to the same picture where the action of the uh, evolution operator is not to change the radius of some sphere we defined in our foliation, but to move time in some sense. And this will be the map from the plane to the cylinder, okay? So what you do, so, Let's get rid of this. So here it is useful to perform a conformal transformation to map RD, and I will do things now in the wick rotated version, okay, not the Minkowski version, and we'll see what that entails in a little bit. Uh, so it's useful to map RD to R times S D minus one. Okay, so how do you do this? So you take, you take uh, the um, length element in RD, and you pull out an R squared. and you redefine things so this is e to the 2 tau times ds squared um, where now you have defined this tau to be, um, well, r is defined to be e to the tau. Okay, so this, this then defines, as you see, uh, defines uh, the metrics are equivalent. You have this factor of e to the two tau, and then you have the flat metric here. So tau, Changing, changing r, because of the relation e to the tau, changing r by a dilatation. So remember, a dilatation acts on the, uh, it changes the radius of the sphere, so it goes to something like e to the lambda r, or let's call it just lambda r. Then this means that this tau goes to tau plus log lambda. Okay? So in one picture, we have a dilatation which changes the radius of the sphere, in the other picture, it became something like regular time evolution in this variable tau. So now in this variable tau, it's easy to define conjugation because we can do the same thing we did uh, in the standard picture. Sorry? Yeah, that's the foliation I chose, right, initially. Yeah, yeah, that's right. No, uh, not for this mapping. It's still a formal mapping. Of, uh, the, way, the way this has, the way, if you want to picture for this, you know, we had this picture over here. And now what happened is this picture went to the 
sort of a cylinder picture, where this is the direction. Uh, so this was, you know, the direction R. This is the direction tau, and then each of these spheres became, you know, uh, a circle on the cylinder. Yeah. Well, at every point in T, instead of having circles, like from the S D minus one, you would get an S one, you will get spheres, and then you will get hyperspheres and so on. I don't know how to draw this, but uh, yeah, maybe Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, maybe there are subtleties with but formally, as far as the transformations go, you know, I can do it in any D. I'm sure you have uh, legitimate subtleties in mind. Uh, I see. Yeah, as far as I am concerned here, I just, I'm just trying to define conjugation. But, yeah, we can, we can talk about this, uh, this more later. Yeah. Okay, very good. So, okay, good. So, in this, in this picture, um, let me write it over there. So in this picture, we can define operators on the cylinder. That look like you have your parameter tau, which tells you where you are here on, the, on this axis, and then some normal vector, uh, some normal unit vector. And this operator is defined as e to the delta tau um, times the flat, I mean the radial quantization uh, operator in flat space at x e to the tau times n, where this is okay. So you define this, this uh, cylinder operator, and then conjugation of this operator is the same as conjugation of an operator in the wick rotated CFT. And you know in the wick rotated CFT, um, I erased it, but when we wick rotate, so we had this e to the minus i x dot p o e to the i x p, but when we, when we wick rotate, we're going to lose the eye, right? And so when we take the dagger in Euclidean signature, this is going to come here, but there is no eye to change the sign for the T0 component. So the time will pick up a minus sign when you wick rotate in Euclidean signature. And the same exact thing will happen here. So the dagger uh, of this operator is equal to just taking the same operator and changing the sign uh, of time. 
this is completely standard to completely equivalent to standard quantization in uh, weak rotated for weak rotated uh, quantum field theory. Oh. You can write this formula about this primary, no? Yes. And then, uh, for not primary, for descendants, the. For. For, um, for, for descendant operators, once you have defined it, you can always, you know, take the appropriate derivatives in correlation functions and then define that way what it means. This, this is for primary operators at this point. Yes? And spinning operators, quantization is, of course, a little bit more tricky in that case. There are various I's to put in. Uh, for each of the you know indices in, uh, that carry spin, uh, but you can go through a similar similar construction to this. Yeah. Okay, so using this now in this picture where we have regular time translations, and we recalled how we quantized in, Wicker, in uh, Euclidean signature, we got this sign over here. Now we can convert this back using this equation to what it means for an operator um, at x. And this turns out to be equal to e to the minus 2. You can check this. Delta t, O flat. So what happened compared to uh, compared to uh, the operator at x, which was e to the tau times n, you see we got e to the minus tau times n, so we sort of inverted the position. And here we got this e to the minus 2 delta t. So this you can write as 1 over x to the 2 delta times o. at x mu over x squared. So this is the action of conjugation in radial quantization for an operator, and it amounts to basically an inversion action on the operator. So in radial quantization, the message is that conjugation acts by inversion. OK? So. Uh, before the break, let me just say that since conjugation acts by inversion, when we conjugate operators in the algebra, again, we can use inversion. And if you look at, you know, what is the conjugated operator to, say, D, you will find that d dagger is equal to d. You will find that m mu nu dagger is equal to m mu nu, which is, you know, oh, sorry, minus m mu nu, which is the generator of rotations, Lorentz transformations. And then you will find, if you recall, we said it yesterday, that k mu is an inversion, a translation, and then an inversion back, right? Because we said how k mu you, you know, fixes 0 and moves infinity, it does this because you invert first, so 0 became infinity, then you move it, and then you invert back. And therefore, this means that k mu is p mu dagger, okay? Because the action of conjugation is inversion. So conjugating by inversions relates the operator k mu and p mu dagger. Okay, so in radial quantization, this is how operators in the algebra conjugate. And now we're going to use this, uh, perhaps after the break, um, to derive the so-called uh, unitarity bounds. All right. Any question? Okay, then let's have 10 minutes break.
right? Let, let's start again. Uh, ju just one little link. Uh, when you ask questions, in principle, I should pass you the mic. Otherwise, people and the recording will not catch your question. Okay, so let's try. Let's see if it works. Okay. Okay, so now we'll use this, uh, these ideas of radial quantization to, um, to derive unitarity bounds. So unitarity bounds will be statements about the lowest dimension operators can take in, in, uh, in conformal field theories, okay? And, you know, we went through this idea of conjugation because we want to be able to define, uh, to define um, products of states, inner products of states. So we might here consider something in order to, to look at constraints that arise on these deltas that we've been writing down, we might start by looking at something like, let's write it like this. So you take P mu on some state generated by the operator OI. So this is a primary operator at x equals zero, okay? So this is one state. And then you take the same, the same state, the dagger of it, it's going to be something like maybe a different index OJ. Um, and let's write it like this, let's write it like P nu OJ, and let's compute this object over here. So it's just uh, some state and its complex conjugate, and we will demand for unitarity that this is uh, non-negative. Yes. Sorry? You get the order of it? <laughs> oh, you, you want this on this side? Sure, okay, you can have it on that side. Yep. Okay, good. So, you write, and then we have OI, and we know that this P mu dagger from uh, what we discussed just now is K mu, P mu, OJ. And of course, we want this to be larger than or equal to zero. And I didn't write it here, maybe I should. This is a primary inserted at x equal to zero. So what we now want is uh, to compute this commutator over here, but we know that we can simply substitute this product by the commutator because the other term will act with k on this state, but that's a state generated by a primary and we're gonna get at zero and we're gonna get zero. So instead of having this, I can easily just take the commutator in here and now I can use the algebra And I will use the algebra in, in uh, Euclidean signature. We've been working in Euclidean signature. And this will be D delta mu nu minus uh, M mu nu. So no J. And there's a factor of two that is not important. So this must be bigger than or equal to zero. And now we know how to act with D on the right. We know that this operator uh, um, 
OJ has some scaling dimension delta, and this will give us the eigenvalue uh, of this operator. So um, we will get here 2 times delta, where delta is the scaling dimension of OJ, uh, 2 times delta, and then we have our delta mu nu. Um, and by the way, th there was an i and a minus i that will come from here, and the i and the minus i will give you 1, so I, uh, they don't, they're not important, so the, sign, the, the order here remains. So there is 2 delta, delta mu nu, minus the action of this operator on OJ at 0 will just involve the spin matrices, because you know, there's the x mu d nu minus x mu d mu, but that has x in it and goes away. So you only get the spin matrices uh, over here. And now I can pull all this out and write it as 2 delta delta mu nu minus s mu nu. on this to zero. So what we end up showing is that if this is positive over here, this is going to be some delta ij because we have these constraints of conformal symmetry coming from uh, the action of k mu on the two-point function. Then what we're showing is that in order for, posi in order for, posi for unitarity to be valid, we need this 2 delta delta mu nu matrix to be uh, minus s mu nu matrix to be you know positive definite which means that um, the maximum eigenvalue of this x mu nu has to be smaller than uh, actually there was a 2 here as well so this 2 is not there so the so so the, the outcome of this inequality is that delta must be larger than or equal the maximum eigenvalue of s uh, mu nu. So this over here, sorry? Why do you demand it to be more than zero? It's a scalar product of uh, two arbitrary states. It's positive definite. It's positive definite. No, the, I, I will be made. It's a positive, we, we want this, so the i will be equal to j because this is delta ij because of constraints of conformal symmetry on the two-point function. And the matrix in new new indices, by uh, what I mean by uh, unitarity is that this is a positive definite matrix. Maybe, maybe, maybe instead of bigger than or equal here, I should have written some, there is some notation like, I don't know, something like this. This is perhaps a better notation. Yeah, thanks. Very good. Oops. Okay. And, okay, so we are, in order for this matrix to be positive uh, definite, what we now need is that this delta, uh, which multiplies the identity matrix, is bigger than the uh, maximum eigenvalue of S mu nu. Otherwise, we would have a negative eigenvalue for 
this difference, and that would not be a positive definite matrix. Okay? Very good. So now we have to understand how to compute eigenvalues of this spin matrix, this uh, spin matrix uh, over here. And, um, you know, this is not, this is not very hard. What you have to do is look at a certain, say, representation of this matrix, perhaps the ve vector representation of this matrix, which is given in terms of, uh, again, deltas, like that. And then you use, um, you use tricks like you do in quantum mechanics to find the eigenvalues of operators when you have something like uh, an operator like uh, multiplied with another operator. In quantum mechanics, you use something like you have L dot S and you write this as one half L plus S squared minus L squared minus S squared. And then these are Casimirs and you know how the Casimirs, what the eigenvalues of the Casimirs are on states and you can evaluate them, and then you can find the eigenvalues of a product like this. Um, a similar trick you can do, I'm not gonna go through it, a similar trick you can do for this operator over here, and depending on the representation under Lorentz transformations that these operators belong to, you will get different things, right? So, for example, if this operator is a scalar, so if these indices i and j are not even there, then this S is zero, and then what you immediately find from here, so for, for OI scalar, what you find from here is that delta is bigger than or equal to zero, okay? In fact, it turns out that for a scalar operator, there is a stronger condition you can get. In order to get the stronger condition, what you have to look at um, is you take p squared on O and you look at the norm of that and you demand that that's bigger than or equal to zero and this will give you a stronger constraint on the dimension of a scalar you will find that the dimension of a scalar has to be larger than or equal to d minus two over two, where d is the space-time dimension, okay? And it turns out, although the proof of this is not, uh, is not simple at all, that considering, so here we consider the linear uh, one power of p acting on the state, here we consider two powers of p, so you might say, oh, I may get stronger constraints if I consider further states with more powers of p acting on the state, but it turns out you don't. For a scalar, this is the stronger constraint you will get. And then for other representations, for example, if you took a, a, a spin L traceless symmetric representation of the Lorentz group, the computation then, then this S is non-zero, so you really have to do this computation I, I, I only described very briefly here. And then you find that for a spin L operator, its delta is bigger than or equal to L plus D minus two. And if you have some mixed symmetry operator, which is not integer spin, it's some mixed Young tableau uh, in the representation theory, then you'll get some other, uh, some other uh, bound, but you will always get a bound by considering essentially norms of descendant states and requiring that they are positive definite like we did here, okay? And another, another comment here is that whenever this bound over here is saturated, for example, for a scalar, whenever delta is d minus two over two, then you satisfy a, a condition where then p squared on O is actually equal to zero, which in some financial representation will tell you that for a scalar operator that satisfies the unitarity bound, that saturates the unitarity bound, del squared on phi is equal to zero. So it satisfies the uh, massless Klein-Gordon equation, although this does not come here from a Lagrangian or anything like that. In CFTs, just requiring unitarity gives you that a free scalar will have the dimension that you knew already from, you know, uh, writing down Lagrangians for the free scalar and asking for a canonical kinetic term 
and then looking at the dimension of the field phi. Yes? Uh, so is there a meaning for, uh, I mean, can you say something about the meaning of unitarity outside of radial quantization, uh, like with the formalism that we had before radial quantization? I could, I could do, you know, let, you can do the following exercise. Take, it's a simple exercise, but, uh, so I'm not going to go through it, but If you didn't want to go through all this, how you might see that uh, states that are descendants, you know, P's on primaries, might give you a problem. How you might see that? Well, you'll say, well, I wrote down, let's take a simple case, phi of x, phi of 0. We wrote down that this is 1 over x squared to the power delta phi, right? Okay, we wrote this down, very good. Now let me consider the correlation function d squared phi d squared phi, right? So what I'm going to have to do here to compute this, I'm going to take two x derivatives. I'm going to take two y derivatives. I'm going to write this as 1 over x minus y uh, uh, squared delta phi, and then I'm going to take y to 0, right? So I'm going to do all this computation. And because these derivatives will start acting on this denominator here, you're going to start to generate uh, very, some function here of this delta phi. And because after you act with enough derivatives, you're going to get some metric somewhere. And then you're going to contract that metric somewhere as well. This function will depend also on the space-time dimension. Right? And then you're going to get back something uh, over here. OK, good. So I'm not being careful, but I'm just describing this computation. You might do this, and then you might require you might require that this is positive because you want this to be a unitary theory. Well, this will then set a constraint on what this might be, and this constraint will turn out to be exactly the same thing. Yes, you get you're right. You get stronger constraints by putting L to zero from the beginning than, to take, but than by taking the limit L goes to zero um, of, the, of this expression for the, traceless, for the spin L operators. Yeah, the scalars are special in some sense. OK. The, the problem with doing it this way, well, it's the same problem. It, well, it's not clear that considering higher momentum, uh, you know, descendants with more powers of the momentum, it's not clear that you're not going to get anything stronger. So this is the product of, you know, uh, uh, various papers that have proven, well, I don't know to what degree of rigor you can say they have proven, but they have proven that for scalars, for example, you do not get any improvement on this bound by considering uh, further states. And for spin L operators, you do not get an improvement of this bound. And you know that, for example, for L, for L equal 1, you will not get an improvement of this bound, because if your theory has a, a global symmetry, for example, it will have a current with L equal 1. And in that case, that current will have dimension equal right, uh, to d minus 2 and, uh, sorry, to d minus 1. So uh, you cannot improve on this bound at least for L equals 1. You cannot improve it for L equals 2 either, because you know that in that case you might have the stress-energy tensor in your theory, and that has dimension equal to D. So you know that for L equals 2 you cannot improve on that bound either, based on, on basically uh, the existence of known operators. Yes? It's a very simple one. So uh, does that work for arbitrarily high uh, by something for arbitrarily high L? For, higher, uh, for things that people usually call higher spin currents, uh -huh. uh, you, can, you can have uh, operators that get very close to saturating this bound. Uh, but free theory, in free theory, you'll have these operators. I wrote them down yesterday. Phi. Uh, 
Oh, okay. You know, phi, you know, d, various d's here, phi. You can make a primary out of such operators, and uh, they can have spin l, mu 1 to mu l. We have to appropriately take other combinations with derivatives to make them into a primary, and then in the free theory, they will saturate this bound. In any interacting theory, they will pick up an anomalous dimension, and it will be what some people refer to as this weakly broken higher spin symmetry okay. that you have uh, from the free theory. Thanks. And the, I mean, weakly broken higher spin because, for example, the stress energy tensor remains uh, unbroken, but higher ones, like these ones with L higher than 2, will get an anomalous dimension. Yeah. Yes? You can prove that, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's the saturation of this bound, then it gets translated to something like this being equal to zero. So in order for the norm of a, an operator to be equal to zero, in a positive, in, in a product Hilbert space, it must be that the operator itself is zero. So the p to the right power, whatever it is on this operator, oh, must give zero. Okay. Good. So this is unitarity, and uh, it came it came here from requiring that we take a primary, we require that its norm is positive, and then we look at descendants of that primary and require that their norms are positive, and that tells us something about the lowest dimension that primary can have. Okay. Now. We, we will start talking about the operator product expansion. And here also, this representation that we, uh, that we discussed in terms of the Hilbert space will allow us to make some very nice statements compared to field theory, to general field theory. So people call this usually the OPE. So this is perhaps familiar, right? In, in any quantum field theory, it is expected that if you take a bilocal product of operators, one defined at x, one defined at y, and you, try to and you start to bring them close together, then that you might be able to replace this bilocal product of operators with a local sum, with a sum of local uh, uh, operators, okay? So usually you say that you take some operator O1 at x, some other operator O2 at Y, and then you say that in some sense, as far as substituting this product into correlation functions, if X and Y are close, you say that I can replace this with some coefficients uh, CK, OK, maybe at Y, at point Y, and you sum over all the Ks. All the X dependents, so this CK coefficients depend on X minus Y, and the operator O depends on just Y. So the, X dip the distance went into this C number coefficients and the operator remained only at a certain point. This point could be, choos could be chosen to be different, uh, but the point is that the answer on the right-hand side involves uh, local operators. Okay, very good. So, and then in field theory, when you discuss the operator product expansion, you, you typically say, well, you know, this is an asymptotic expansion, and uh, it makes sense to put it into correlation functions, but it's an asymptotic expansion like everything else. One has to be very careful. Now, thanks to this radial quantization picture, in, in a conformal field theory, things are a lot more, are a lot better, uh, because we know that in a CFT, In any CFT, we can insert, as we argued, operators inside the sphere. So this operator O1 at point uh, X, maybe you take the operator O2 at some other, at some point, at point zero. So let's put it close to the origin. And we know that if we uh, insert these operators inside the sphere, that they will create some state on the sphere, right? This is. Uh, what, we say, what we said the state operator correspondence does 
in radial quantization. You insert operators inside the sphere, you get states on the sphere. Uh, but, and then this state over here, psi, will have an expansion uh, in terms of a basis of states uh, of eigenstates of the dilatation operator, the ones we call delta of n. This form a complete basis. So any state in the Hilbert space created by any product of operators, whatever it might be, will have an expansion in this basis. Okay? Now this state by the state operator correspondence was created by phi 1 of x, phi 2 of 0, acting on the vacuum. And um, and on the right-hand side, we have a sum, a sum over, I, I should have said, I should have said here that this stays delta n uh, are not just states created by primaries for a general, it's a general state. So this is clear because we're inserting an operator at x here, an operator at zero here. This is some x dependence that, as we said already before, does not generate an eigenstate of the dilatation operator, but a linear combination, an infinite linear combination of eigenstates of the dilatation operator with different eigenvalues. And therefore, uh, this means that this over here contain both primaries and descendants. Okay, but the descendants are the derivatives on the primary, so you might be able to define, formally at least, some operator x, well, that is a function of x, and also a function of uh, derivatives at point y, acting on the vacuum, and in the end, you take y equal to zero. So this equation over here tells you that you start with the bilocal product of operators acting on the vacuum, then you go to a set of states. These are both primaries and descendants, but I only want to keep the primaries, and so I write that there is a certain operator, the CO, here, I sum over only the primaries. Um, I take y to zero, and this operator CO, this differential operator CO, carries the x dependence of the left-hand side, and these derivatives generate all the descendants of the primary I'm summing, of the, of the, of the primary that I'm summing over. So I have converted the statement here, where this n goes over all the primaries and the descendants, formally at least, we will see how much it makes sense to have this quantity here into a statement, into a sum over only primaries with an associated differential operator out front that is responsible to generate all the descendants appropriately. So this is not free. This is not an operator that's free to be whatever it wants to be. It's completely determined by conformal symmetry. And by the way, all the descendant states have to be generated uh, inside, the, inside, the, inside the conformal multiplet. Uh, and we will spend some time now to understand what this, what, the, what this operator is, but the state operator correspondence in a CFT immediately proves that this uh, type of OPE exists in a conformal field theory. And furthermore, since we know that any state in the Hilbert space can be written as a sum of, you know, states, normalized states in the Hilbert, in the Hilbert space, then that shows that uh, the OPE is not just some asymptotic expansion in a CFT, but it's actually convergent. Just using the argument that in a Hilbert space, any state can be written as a linear combination of eigenstates uh, in some basis, you can show that in a CFT, the OPE is a convergent uh, expansion. Okay. So once, once we say this, then what we have to understand a little bit better is what form this differential operator CO uh, takes. And how much time do I have? Maybe five minutes or so? Oh, 15. 15, okay, good. 
So we have plenty of time, good. Okay, so let's try to understand what this differential operator looks like. And in order to do this, we will consider the OPE of two operators, phi1 and phi2, and we will take the contribution of one particular operator. So what we have here is the equivalent statement to what I was saying here, that you take the product of operators, there is going to be some x dependence in the front, and then I have not inserted yet this, this operator over here, but I have written here the operator that's a primary plus all its descendants here, and then there is further sum over other primaries and their descendants, right? Okay, very good. For, so let's first try to understand what this k over here is. In order to understand what this k is, let's act with d on this product. Okay, if I act with d on this product, um, I will get minus i delta 1 plus x dot d plus delta 2, where delta 1 and delta 2 are the eigenvalues of these operators in the, uh, of this operator in the, under dilatations. And I will get the same thing back. And um, now using here, again, this, I find, and acting with this x dot d and so on, I find, if I did everything correctly, that this is minus i delta 1 plus delta 2 minus k c over x to the k plus all the other stuff I'm not going to write down, okay? So on the one hand, this is what I get if I act with d on the left-hand side. Now if I act with d on the right-hand side, and I act on this operator O0, then this will give me this will give me uh, the corresponding delta O to this operator O0. So if I want the left-hand side to match the right-hand side, the minus I is okay, the c over x to the k will go away. So what I get is that delta 1 plus delta 2 minus k is equal to delta O. So k is delta 1 plus delta 2 minus delta O. Okay? So this is the power that appears uh, in this OPE expansion in front of the operator uh, O of dimension delta O. Okay? Good, so now we know what this k looks like, but we still don't know how we can use the symmetry to determine this differential operator, because all we did now is we took the, the primary to generate the descendant, we need to act with this differential operator, so now we're gonna see what that looks like and how it generates the, the descendant states and how it's constrained by conformal symmetry. Is this, is this clear? Good. Okay, so in order to, in order to understand how to generate the operator CO, uh, we take again the same OP, but now we're gonna keep a descendant state. So, So we're going to write down our operator O at zero, and we will put some arbitrary coefficient here that we will determine. And then there are more descendants over here, and of course there are more primaries as well. So here I'm taking one derivative on O, 
and I have to do something with the index of the derivative, and what you have to do is multiply it with x mu and contract it, and this will give the contribution of the descendant state uh, into the OPE. Okay, so with this, let's take k mu now and act on the left-hand side. Again, if, you, if these are primaries, the only one I have to act on is this one because this is a primary at zero, so I don't have to worry about this guy. I can take it out of the commutator. Uh, and then the, the action, just to remind you, of k mu on, on, on phi one will involve a little bit of a complicated uh, operator. These are scalars, so there are no s mu nu matrices. Um, on phi 1, and then you're going to have again the product phi 1, phi 2, which you will again substitute using this, okay? And this will then act on c over x to the k O0 plus other things. And when you do all this, what you find um, is... Let's not do it yet. We'll do it in a little bit. On the other hand, if I take this k mu and I act on O0, I will kill it because it's a primary, but I will not kill this contribution. In fact, k mu uh, will kill the derivative in some sense, right? Because k mu with p uh, have a commutator which is proportional to dilatations and Lorentz transformations. These are scalars, so the dilatations will, uh, sorry, the Lorentz transformations will not act there are no uh, associated spin matrices, and so uh, what you will get is uh, from d mu o, you will get o when you act with k mu on the contribution c over x to the k, and then you have this alpha x mu d mu on o zero. So this is the right thing you need to act to match the action on the product from the left-hand side, because you need to get o, not anything else. Okay, and uh, let's see if you evaluate this, being careful, you might find what I found, which is minus 2c over x to the k alpha x mu i delta o. Okay, so this is what you might find. So now, this must match this, so the right-hand the right side, sides must match as well, and obviously, acting with these d mu's, you know what this k is as related to the dimensions of uh, the operators phi 1, phi 2, and O. You do this computation, you take the derivatives, and what you find in the end, you should check my math, is that alpha, is delta 1 minus delta 2 plus delta O divided by 2 delta O. Okay? So, you know, obviously we're summing over different primaries and we chose the simplest one, one with dimension delta O but crucially with spin 0 so that we didn't have to worry about the spin matrices. But this logic, uh, obviously in the OPE of phi 1 and phi 2, we will not only have scalars on the right-hand side, we will also have uh, spinning operators, spinning primaries, as I mean. Of course, you'll have descendants that have spin. Um, in that case, similar computations can be done, and you will be able to again show um, that this operator, has a well-defined expansion, and you can determine all coefficients in this expansion using the constraints that come from the dilatation, acting with dilatations, and acting with uh, special conformal transformations in this way, on the left and the right side of the OPE. So the upshot of this is that this operator is fixed by conformal symmetry Um, and 
there is, there is another way to, say, to, to, to determine this operator. Perhaps, you know, this is algebraically convenient, but maybe it's not the best way to do things. There is another way, however, to argue that this operator exists, and is to say that since I know my OPE is a convergent expansion, I can go to any correlation function, for example, a three-point function, and stick it into the three-point function, right? And then I will be able to use the OPE uh, and end up with a two-point function, right? So how does that look? Suppose you take phi one of x, phi two uh, of zero, and then maybe you call some operator O prime at point, at point Z, okay? I'm free to go here and use the OPE, and this will look like something like um, sum over O. There is this little coef coefficient little c corresponding to O. Then there is this operator CO of x dy, where now I, 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 in order to write down the differential operator, I pretend that this is y, and then I'm going to take y to 0. Then I'm left with a two-point function, O at y, O prime at z. And then maybe I'll take y equal to 0 in the very end. And from this sum, we proved by conformal symmetry that uh, there is only, uh, the only possibility for an operator to have a two-point function with another operator is for them to have the same scaling dimension. And that, in fact, you can always diagonalize this matrix of two-point functions so that an operator can have a two-point function only with itself, okay? So in this way, you can determine and relate this coefficient over here, this, this differential operator over here, to the three-point function using the known form of the two-point function of operators from conformal uh, invariance, okay? So this is another way to think about this, this operator CO. But in any case, both ways, allow you to determine this CO. So from a long time ago, from the 70s, people had made such computations and had determined the operator, this, this differential operator CO, uh, you know, w keeping more terms than I just did here, which I, where I kept only the leading descendant, they kept more and more terms and they could always determine this, uh, the, the, the associated coefficients that define this operator. And eventually it was, realized how to use this uh, operator to write down, um, maybe we'll start that discussion tomorrow, but eventually it was realized how to use this operator in a four-point function and perform an appropriate summation that allows you to express the four-point function in this so-called conformal block decomposition. So this was realized by Hugh here uh, some time ago, 2004, or no? something like that. So although, although such computations were done, such, such you know, order by order like computations were done since the 70s, uh, uh, nobody could you know, resum in some sense this thing and find what this operator actually is, even more so express the four point function in a way that this conformal block decomposition that is basically the starting point for the bootstrap uh, until this work uh, uh, by Hugh and his collaborator. Uh, so it's, you know, this looks like a trick, but it's really the starting point. Understanding how this operator behaves is the starting point to the conformal block decomposition, which is the starting point to the whole conformal bootstrap program. So let's do that tomorrow, and uh, let's stop here. Any question? Yes. So um, I was wondering how much of this uh, radio quantization construction should or should not survive uh, when unitarity is broken. Uh, of course, we don't have a positive definite scalar product anymore, but one can still define primaries and descendants and hopefully an OPE. 
I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah I think the quantization, it doesn't, it doesn't care um, if you have unitarity or not. Defining, defining the conjugate of an operator, of course, depends on what kind of quantization you use, and that will go through as well, but of course you can no longer demand positivity of norms of descendants like we did, and if you don't have unitarity in the Hilbert space, and therefore you will not be able to get the unitarity bounds and so on. But beyond that, I don't think any, anything else really breaks. Yes? Let's say I didn't know anything about radial quantization, good first approximation, and I was just trying to compute this C function order by order like you did here. Could I use that to argue for the convergence of the OP? You can look at correlation, I didn't do it, you can look at correlation functions in radial quantization, express all the correlation functions instead of, you know, the way I've been expressing them with points X and Z and so on, you can express them all in radial quantization and go through the calculations there. No, uh, you don't want to. I want to argue for the Oh, oh. Do okay, that. sorry, yes. Um, there, is a, there, is, there is work where this has been done, yes. So originally it was not done in radial quantization. Originally there were papers by Mac and others, if I remember correctly, uh, that were observing that the OPE is a convergent expansion in conformal field theories without using radial quantization. Radial quantization provides the shortcut where I can invoke the Hilbert space theorems to then say that this is convergent. But certainly, uh, there is a paper by Slava Rizkov and collaborators where they go through this very carefully, both from the Hilbert point of view, and they examine convergence of the OPE in CFTs. Uh, I, can, I can point you to that paper, but they discuss in there the old literature and they give both perspectives. All right, so let's stop here and we start again at uh, 11.15.